Welcome everybody to the Invasives BC graduation. Um, here is an overview of our agenda today. So first we'll have a message from leadership um, from Room and Carter. Next we'll have a message from the product sponsor Perry Grills. Um, and then myself, Zoe, I'll introduce the team, the team and the contributors. And then I'll also introduce our applications. Mike Shasko will lead us through what problem we are trying to solve. Then the Invasives team will go through 30 minutes of demonstrations. Mike Shasko will then go through the future of Invasives BC. And then the team will go through some community contributions and then we'll finish off with some lessons learned and favorite moments. Um, so please note that we'll have a couple minutes at the end of each demo for some questions, but just keep your questions as concise as possible as we'll have limited time to answer. And then if we have time remaining at the end, then I'll open the floor back up for questions. All right, so introducing the team. So we have Mike Shasko, the product owner, Jake Morris, the outgoing Scrum Master, myself, Zoe Simon, the incoming uh, Scrum Master. We have Pushin, Roop, Andrea, and Amir, and then previous team members and other contributors, including Raj, Arvind, Michael Wells, Prakriti, Jonathan, Kendall olson Mayer, Kristen, and Dave. I'm, I'm going to ask Zoe, I think you skipped a few people. Who did I skip? Ruman and Perry. Oh. Also Ruman and Perry. Oh! <laughs> you guys' introduction. I'll let you catch up now. Thanks, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for stopping me, Mike. <laughs> hey, Mike, you're always looking out after me. Yeah, I gotta, you know. <laughs> yeah. These directors that move around, right? So, is Ruman on, Zoe? I think so. Ruman, can you hear us? Uh, maybe not. Ruman, you're muted. He's on the line. He is on the line. It shows him as unmuted and your camera's are on, so don't see him. Hey, try that. There we go. There okay. you go, Ruman. Right on. You're, you're first on the list for Ruman, so. Hey, How Perry. You? Thanks very much. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just do my best to be your setup man. Um, and then, you know, more to the point to set up for the, the team that's done the work. And I, you know, I think it says a message from leadership. Um, I, sh I should have caught that before it went up. Um, how about we do a message about leadership? Um, and, you know, I know that that is uh, integral to the approach that we all share, this whole team shares uh, in respect to this work. Um, but if I'm going to personalize, you know, my 120 seconds, I'm a, I'm a former wildlife biologist. Uh, 100 years ago, I was in university learning about the impacts of invasive species on conservation on the province. And so um, that matter has always been close to my heart. And the fact that this team had an opportunity to come into the lab um, to do its work um, was always something that I was keen to, to see manifest. Um, you know, and in that regard, I was also aware of the history of how, you know, this work came about. Um, you know, as ever, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, transparent and candid, um, some decisions, you know, were made in respect of like the bundling of projects that maybe, you know, we would do those decisions, um, you know, differently now. And my point with all of that is to say that um, this, this team, as I have seen it, has done an excellent job of making the best of hard circumstances. Um, and that surprises me not at all, you know, when I consider as I, you know, look on the screen at, at Perry, um, who's definitely um, and you can laugh at me for describing you as such, Perry, but you're, you're an original gangster uh, of change and innovation and continuous improvement. Um, and uh, I appreciate the way in which you have always lent into opportunities um, for change and for leadership. Um, and I want to say, you know, thank you also, you know, broadly to the team, you know, Mike, for you jumping in um, to a situation, you know, which is like, obviously, super new to you, um, being supported by a team, you know, um, that uh, has had some some time in the lab uh, and supported, you know, you and your role, Mike, um, and connected into Accelerate and Deliver this product. So 
for me, it's just, it's a, it's an expression of gratitude, as I say, personalizing it from my own background and own values and the values that I know we share of the province. Um, and thanks for everybody pulling together to do their best while they're in the lab. And then also to sign off and say, you're not done. There's a lot of work to be done um, still. And I know that in terms of, you know, in terms of your backlog and also in terms of the fact that, you know, this, this change that you've been part of is, is very much not complete. Um, and you're going to continue to face challenges that you will take on handily, I know, um, as you get into this next phase of your work. So I invite you to lean into those. I invite you to lean into, you know, folks that I see on the line here, folks like Jill and Catherine, um, who've been walking this path with you for a long time. And we'll continue to support you as a community as you, you know, instantiate, mature and sustain this method of doing work, continuously improving and growing and learning um, as you proceed in the future. So my hat's off to you, my thanks. Uh, and Perry, my OG friend, uh, over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Ruman. Um, you know, I must, I must first thank the team here for all your hard, diligent work and never giving up. Um, just keep pushing and going forward here. And, and Ruman, I must thank you for giving us the come into the lab um, you know, I, I've been at this a very long time, you know, and I've shared with the team that I, I never give up. I keep looking for the opportunities and, and I believe I'm actually in the, uh, of being in the aims office and on that IT steering committee for Flynn Roll. Yesterday, actually this morning, they put the executive meeting into my calendar so I'll be there again, representing this team at, at the executive level. So it, it's a, uh, it's a journey that you can't get rid of right to the very end when uh, this team is actually looked upon by the rest of government on, on what you can do to, uh, to persevere and improve on and keep going forward to develop solutions for the province and for the, for the citizens of British Columbia. So, Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate everyone's hard work. And Ruman, our paths will always cross and continue to cross. So thanks, everyone. For better, for better or for worse, Perry. Absolutely. Oh, always for better. <laughs> Great. Right thank on. you guys. I'm happy back that you, I'm happy that I was able to come back to you. All right, so let's continue on in our introduction. So I'm just going to introduce the applications. So the team has built two applications. The first is called the Inspect Muscle iOS application, and the second is called the Invasives BC Web App. And the team has also started work on a third application, which is the Invasives BC iOS app. So the Inspect app is used by conservation officers to inspect watercrafts coming into the province for invasive mussels. This is the zebra and quagga mussels. And the app serves as an expedited inspection for frequent travelers, normal inspections for general cases, and a high risk inspection for watercrafts coming from areas known to have the invasive mussels. So the app is designed to work both online and offline by caching data from inspections or shifts and syncing it back to our database. This app is currently in production and is being used at all of the inspection points in the province. Secondly, our Invasive BC Web App is our other application that allows its users, invasive plant specialists and ex external invasive plant groups, an inventory and database repository for the creation, treatment and report on BC invasive plants and animals. This app is in production, however, it isn't quite mature enough yet to replace the existing IAP, or the Invasive Alien Plant Program database and map display. So next, Mike Jasko, the product owner, will go through what questions we are trying to answer, and then the team developers will run through uh, some dem demonstrations on what's been built. Thank you, Zoe. Um, yes, we did start the project, uh, we had a, a number of problems that uh, we ultimately wanted to solve and uh, we did address and I'll discuss some of the solutions as well. Bow Innovation really set out um, to develop a, a better workflow um, to replace existing tools and methodologies. Ultimately, we've been working towards a, a unified process to streamline incoming data from the field uh, directly into the database. and making sure that we have the tools in place to ensure more accurate and complete records of those observations. 
um, really in in the past um, the problem has been that there's been too many touch points along the way data uh, data integrity isn't maintained uh, there's an opportunity for errors and omissions so uh, with our application we're we're trying to ensure that you know, we have proper data verification processes in place, but we also worked on better defining elements for observations in the field. So that was one of the overarching uh, problems that um, sort of in, a, in the back of our mind throughout the whole project. The second uh, basic problem was providing uh, support within the applications at a variety of levels. Um, as mentioned, we developed a number of quality control elements, both at the data collection level, uh, as well as the database level. Uh, we did provide uh, tools to the end user to be able to report uh, out on that information, as well as provide editing and data verification within, within the application itself. Um, again, these were uh, uh, elements that were in place, but were recognized as being uh, problematic. And that's one of the, the major areas as well that we focused on. Uh, to that end, we developed uh, a number of um, uh, ways to, to view the information. Uh, we introduced uh, a mapping viewport uh, within the inspect, or sorry, within the invasive component. Uh, we adopted the ability to bring in uh, other data from the warehouse to support uh, data observations, make sure things are properly recorded. And currently, we're working on a variety of extraction and data, uh, data tools to pull information out of that database to ultimately uh, drive and uh, answer business-related questions. The third major problem we had in the last one was coming up with a name. Um, took us a while to come up with a name, and Invasive BC was the the one that we ultimately defined on more of a lighter a lighter point. Um, but that's about it uh, at this point, and I'll be chatting a bit more about um, elements within those applications throughout the presentation. Great, thanks Mike. Okay, so now we can move into our demo. So first up, we have a four minute demo video of the Inspect Muscle iOS app. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Muscle Inspect app. The Muscle Inspect app was created to help officers quickly complete roadside watercraft inspections. The application's data syncs directly to the Invasive BC database. Administration of users and data collected in the Inspect application is managed using the Invasive BC web application. Once a user has been granted access to the application, the home screen displays all of the shifts that a user has associated with their account. Users can see information such as the date of their shift, locations, and their sync status. Let's talk a little bit about syncing while we're on the subject. When a user is on shift and performing inspections, all data is being stored right to their iPad, meaning the app can function while completely offline. Once the user's iPad has an active internet connection, either through Wi-Fi or cellular, and the Inspect app is open, it automatically syncs all data on the iPad to the Inspect database. Users can also manually sync data using the Sync button on the app's home screen. It's looking a little empty around here, so let's go ahead and start a new shift. In the new shift screen, users add basic information about their shift, such as their start time, location, and any other comments that they need to add in. The shift overview screen shows users all of the inspections that are created during a shift, as well as if each inspection is high risk or not. Users can make changes to their shift right up until they sync their shift to the Invasive PC database. Next, let's create a new inspection. The fields on this screen are formatted and ordered to match the flow of officers' inspections questions during a roadside inspection. Inspection form elements are hidden until they're actually needed by the officer. For example, if an inspection is low risk, all fields may not actually be required. We 
try to ensure that the interaction users have with the app is speedy, so we use tappers and things like checkboxes whenever possible. We use text input to allow users to quickly filter a comprehensive list of water bodies easily. The UX of this solution came directly from user feedback while doing user testing with the initial version of the application. Once you complete an inspection, you will return to the shift overview page where you'll be able to create your next inspection. All right, our inspections look good. Let's complete our shift for the day. The shift end section of the shift overview page allows you to enter information about the watercraft you've inspected throughout the day and also any other specifics about your shift. Once you complete your shift, the application will attempt to submit the inspection stored on your iPad to the inspect database based on your internet connection. Since the launch of the inspect app, over 3,400 roadside inspections have taken place. And let's talk a little bit more about the stats there. Of those, 27 have been high-risk watercraft, meaning the watercraft were coming from locations where there was a high risk of bringing either whirling disease or locations that were known to have invasive mussels present. Nine watercraft actually had adult dressed mussels attached or stored in them somewhere. Just a few invasive species can devastate our local ecosystem. That was a quick overview of the Inspect application. Thanks for listening. In this video, I saw comments going on partway through. I hope everybody was able to hear that. I was going to say, don't let that loop again. I've heard, it. I've heard enough. Okay, good. <laughs> I, was just give, I was just giving Roop shine for his smooth VO, Zoe, that's all. It was very good. All right, so now Mike's going to lead us through some of the metrics to success of the Inspect app. Sure. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Yes. So, as uh, Rupa alluded to in the in the in the video, conservation officers are currently uh, using this uh, throughout BC. Um, I think there are currently twelve uh, checkpoints uh, using actively using the particular application. Uh, it's been operational now for for seven weeks, which is which is good. Um, all that information uh, that is synced up. Uh, up to the cloud and ultimately to our database um, is, is put together into uh, right now just a, a CSV file that um, anyone uh, with uh, the inspect uh, admin privileges can download and that information has roughly 50 or so variables and it's automatically um, updated every time something gets synced to it and that information can be brought into a spreadsheet or another database for subsequent analysis. Um, we now have, actually as of this morning, 3,700 inspections. Um, and that is, continues to grow a couple hundred each day, depending on uh, day of the week and uh, how much activity is happening across the province. One of the interesting things that has uh, been very useful for this uh, project is that that water body table that we saw in the video, we now have over 12,000 water bodies listed in North America. So the inspectors can readily find uh, where that boat has come in, where the boat has come from and where it's going to. And we've standardized the locations of those pieces. So we'll be able to do further analytics on you know, where hotspots are, where people are going with the boats and what further activity might be required. Um, for, for future um, uh, inspection components. Um, right now, the, the future of the app, it's, it's fairly stable. It's working well. Um, we're sort of in a maintenance mode in terms of um, the collection interface. We do get occasional reports now directly from the users with regards to any problems they find with the application. Um, and we're able to act upon those in a fairly timely manner. We will can be continuing to improve the analytics uh, so to support the data collection process and hopefully improve you know, actionable responses to prevent uh, infestations in BC waters. Any 
questions associated with the Inspect app before we, we, we move on to other things. Other than, you know, hiring root for voiceovers. Okay, if we don't have Zoe, any I don't questions. see any questions or yeah, if we if if you guys think of questions, you can always hold it till the end and we That's might true. have time to yeah. answer them. Yeah. All right. So with that, let's move into our next demo, which will be Andrea and Pushin. So I will stop sharing my screens screen so you guys can share. Thank you, Zoya. Um, the invasive BC web application has you know a multi-component application. Let me share my screen. Uh, first, I want to just give you a brief technical overview of our project. Um, is my screen visible to you guys? Okay. Yeah. Yes, we can see it, Pushan. So, yeah. Do you want to make that full screen? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so these are the basic, you know, platform and framework we use for this application. Uh, we have two application. One is our API server and one is our front end or app server. So we use OpenShift as a deployment platform, Docker for the containerization technology, Node.js as a runtime, Express for REST API, Postgres, Postgres for RDBMS, Type ORM for ORM support to front end. MVC architecture leaflet for screen for it's very common for the all cloud native application. This is a architecture diagram of our API server. So yeah, it's this server is deployed in OpenShift and the security and everything is maintained by OpenShift. Additionally, we have a additional security means this server can be requested from anywhere from mobile or from um, browser or desktop application. So here so basically we check the authentication through you know bc key cloak authorization token so we check that token signature for authorization and if we find that it's from valid source then we move forward with that operation and the and this is the front end architecture you don't have any you know additional security for that basically task of this server to fetch the front end assets like javascript html to the browser then browser whole browser browser just rendered these whole things as a single page application which you know take care rest of the thing uh, this is our uh, authorization mechanism so how we authenticate thing uh, we use bc id uh, bc government key clock service and which is configured for ider and bc id so with a valid bc id and ider you can log into our system you get access token Currently, we are storing access token for iPad application. We are storing in the keychain, and uh, for a web application, we are storing in the cookie and coming from an authorized user. Uh, this is a in Docker, Node.js, Timo build API technological stacks. Similarly, for browser, yeah, we have browser. We have an Angular for MVC and custom component, some form framework component to create form in dynamic manner, and finally the HTML with presentation. Yeah, this is a form framework. It is uh, developed by our team. The main goal of this framework to generate dynamic form from database configuration. How it's work in very in a brief, we store the database definition and configuration and display layout information in a schema file called uh, YML uh, extension. Then the form framework, the code, read that file, convert this file, create the database tables and also create an API and auto automation test helper for our application. And this, this particular you know, set of code, set of processes take care of everything. So whenever you create an ML, you configure it, it will automatically create a database for you and also uh, easy to create an API for you. And then this API is consumed by the front, uh, you know, front end part of the form framework, which basically generate a dynamic form for you. So directly database table can be, you know, rep, uh, you know, represented in a form 
in the front in the front end and yeah in our project we use github action for various things like we currently initially we use jenkins but later we completely move to github action in github action we uh, we are running the test and analysis to ensure the code quality with the sonar cube analysis then we run exp it's uh, cypress end to end testing to check everything is working fine then we checking that new code is introduced to the system is build uh, billable is build is fine in the open shift environment or not and then also we running ad additional tests that if the new things are you know even running perfectly on the open shift and also we do run a security uh, check was zap run on the github action and then finally everything is perfect then we merge the code and as per the branch configuration it is deployed on the various system apart from that we have i just want to show you we have a cypress you know dashboard to see our code now you can see this is a latest merge and you see this is merge is not, this run is not successful previously the run is successful yeah and we pass all the test and everything so here and this this cypress dashboard also support the video player so yeah it's help us to ensure the quality of our and health of our overall system yeah that's it from my side the technical perspective then andrea will you know discuss and you know demo some of our feature thank you so any question or we can you know wait for it rest of the last okay Thanks, Christian. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I will run through a quick demo of our Invasive BC web app. Um, it's not going to be as streamlined or smooth as Roop's demo, unfortunately, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, Anyway, when we log into the application, this is our homepage, which is an inventory of every uh, observed plant, invasive plant species. But at the bottom here, we have a table with all our 621 records. Um, for the record, these aren't production records. These are uh, just dummy data that we've seeded the database with. Um, but to give you an example of what an observation looks like, um, we are capturing things like the location, the type of geometry that was used to record uh, the observation, which is uh, a noteworthy difference from IAP, where IAP could only record um, a circle. We've got circles, rectangles, uh, waypoints, so you can have like a kind of zigzag line that follows the uh, shape of a river or a road or things like that. Um, we've got just more information here about uh, how to access the location, general comments, um, and then we record things like the name of the species and the jurisdiction that the location falls within. Um, what type of soil texture, um, the density of the invasive species within the observed application. Um, and then, yeah, there's some more about. Um, but Andrea, could you explain? Maybe just full screen it, just so we, as much as I love seeing your background image. Full screen it, um, yeah. We good? There is a bug here right now, which is why all six, seven columns are squished in. Um, but yeah, so that's what uh, an observation looks like in view mode. Uh, so if we go back to our database page, and then we also have the map at the top here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Uh, this map shows the locations of every observation that is within our database. 
sign, we use circle markers here. So we're indicating that in this approximate area, there's 618 observed uh, invasive plant species. And then up here, there's another two. Um, and if we zoom in on this location, Kamloops, we continue zooming in, um, these start to show the district. Um, and then all integrated our map with um, so you can see up the top here in BC, so these borders. So, um, and this was something that we were able to do after we went to the Mapathon that was hosted a few months ago, just before the lockdown. Um, and that our um, attendance at the Mapathon was a huge help in learning how to pull data from the BC Data Warehouse and how to present it on a leaflet map. So that was a huge help for us. Um, okay, and then, so moving on, um, earlier on today, I created a new observation for us, which is this dwarf eelgrass. Um, so what I'm going to demo now is us treating that observation. Um, so here are just standard fields of what would be captured when we are treating an observation. And because filling all that out is boring, I'm just going to press this generate test data button, which is something that we create, sorry, developers created for ourselves um, just as a quick shortcut to automatically fill out a form using dummy data rather than us having to type in the same thing over and over and over again. So that saved us a lot of time. Um, so that was dummy data, but I'm going to replace some of it with our uh, actual location that the observation was made in. Um, so when you type in your location, it will show up on the map. And so what we're seeing here is that this lat long coordinates corresponds to this location on the map. And nearby we have a well location. Um, and this is more information that's being pulled from the BC data warehouse. Um, and this is information that's relevant to people, especially when they're performing a chemical treatment, um, they need to make sure that Changed our observation that I created earlier. The invasive plant specialists need kind of a workflow to go from what said to do next. Um, but I will just set treatment and then we get taken to this page. That's a we have entered in all our information correctly. So this is that important tie in to treat it. Uh, it goes both ways. I click on that record to be taken back to the record of the treatment. Um, and so the other thing that we've done, we've also got a form for chemical treatment. I won't go into that. Um, and then we've also got monitoring, which is um, a certain length of time after treatment has been applied, someone else would return to that location and just survey the treatment to make sure that it's been effective and it's been done properly or does it need follow up. Um, remedial action. Um, and then next, let me go back to our database. And the other basic search functionality. So if we don't want to have a table to find what we're looking for, we can just bring that in and do export all the time. Probably I will take that as a no. Okay, so then Mike's going to take us through the future of the Invasive BC web app as well. Thanks, Andrea. Um, there was a question, actually. Oh, can we, oh, can we access additional map layers? Uh, currently, no, that is something that is planned for the future, is being able to add your own map layers from the data warehouse. Those three were primarily selected uh, proof of concept, uh, tried to address different types of data that was in the warehouse, like the well and polygons and lines. So 
the um, uh, yeah, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can introduce or have the user introduce, but the, the mechanism to pull that in. Okay, so um, the last application we started that we started towards the end of the project uh, was the um, Mrs. PC iOS application. Um, we started the project, but uh, we had to um, switch the tasks to more uh, crucial tasks to be able to hand off the project. So we have so here's the application that I have it opened up on my iPad. Uh, we can go ahead and add, a, add an observation the same way. Uh, let's say there's a missing plant here. And using an interactive map, they can estimate the area where the uh, users can estimate the area where they've uh, observed um, their observation. We limit the area where they can estimate to 100 meters because it's an estimation and we don't want them to um, uh, exaggerate or be able to estimate large areas. In the future, the plan was to be able to um, offer uh, additional methods of uh, input for the work area. Um, but we didn't quite get to that. Um, yeah, it's a very short one. Any questions? The, the, the introduction um, for our iOS uh, component and where we're going to start to mimic now the same type of input structures that we had in the web piece, but uh, due to time and other constraints, the, the bare back backbone at the moment and uh, we'll continue to grow upon that um, that interface and, and add more and more stuff as time goes on. Is the frame something that we can um, pull in the same way that the front end is built if like builds it in the front end is that something that the iOS will do or do you think you want to bake that in to the iOS application? Uh, we created a different framework uh, for the inspect application that will be imported here. It's not as automated as the web web framework and the big reason behind that is that the um, application just needs to be needs to have all of this information here and needs to be run more smoothly uh, whereas the web application relies on the back end to exist and the two are very interconnected we wanted the application to be the web the mobile application to be more independent oh. great thanks amir so let me just reshare my screen. So now we'll have a summary of what's next on the Invasives Horizon from Mike Shasko. Sure. Yes, yeah, so we have two, two um, pieces here to address. We have the feature of the Invasives web component. Um, we are going to continue with the form framework and the database uh, to support animal and plant observations and related treatment pieces. Uh, looking at enhanced field tools to support detail, the detailed requirements of both the plant and animal specialists. Um, a lot of discussion with regards to planning tools to support daily workflows. Looking at being able to develop those through the web piece um, and then ultimately sending them to the iOS piece. Uh, as Andrea pointed out there at the end, um, we do have a lot of uh, reporting and analytical functions to still address. Um, we are at a stage where we have that connectivity um, in the interface to the database. And now we just have to expand on that, um, addressing specific elements to support business objectives. In terms of the iOS future, um, there's a, still a lot of work to be done uh, within that application. However, since we have the, the database environment uh, established by virtue of the web, uh, web application and all the work that we've done with the inspect app, um, being able to simply, um, you know, in a sense, mimic uh, best of both worlds, we should be able to move much faster in the iOS environment as we already have a repository to store that information, we've already developed the mechanism to sync information from the field and, and deal with all the um, data collection elements um, from an iPad, uh, both in and off, in, in or out of um, cell or Wi-Fi coverage. So that's promising that we'll be able to draw upon those uh, lessons and activities that we've already developed. Um, we are looking at uh, 
for that iOS piece as well, mimicking a lot of the um, functionality that uh, exists now in, in third-party mapping applications that are currently being used by many field staff, uh, focusing on a lot of the mapping component and really interacting with that iPad to um, better uh, define observations and better um, record information out in the field and get it back into our database. Uh, we're going to continue on improving the efficiency and the, the comprehensiveness um, with that application, trying to provide an end-to-end -end workforce workflow solution um, where what you do in the field is immediately put into that database. There's no intermediate steps. Uh, you don't have to download it. You don't have to batch upload it. Uh, we're hoping that it's you know as easy as a one button. Uh, migration for what that information was observed uh, and get it into the database. We're also looking at, uh, as a final thing, um, a citizen science interface to help flag new and existing threats. Uh, we currently have some independent applications that do that, but we feel we can um, uh, integrate some of those components into, a, into that mobile application as well um, and uh, see where it goes. Um, The, I believe uh, I'm at the, the the final the finalized summary. Is that is that correct, Zoe? Or was there anything else that um, we had in in between there? I don't have the agenda up. Um, I think if you're done the future of Invasives BC, then we can move on to the community contributions. Okay. No, I wasn't. <laughs> had a few more pieces. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. The the future of the Invasives, both the web and and the mobile as inspect and inspect as well. Um, we're at a stage where we're able to bring in a lot more database tables that get created uh, through the form framework. This will, will greatly support um, you know, being able to expedite the turnaround when we develop new tables for different different facets of the of the business. Um, we do need to integrate more uh, monitoring tools and, and mechanisms. Um, and we'll be looking at that um, over the next few months, certainly. Uh, continue to develop the analytical and reporting functions as we, as we bring in more data um, and we're able to relate different tables, um, come up with more uh, intelligent looks at that information and be able to pull out information that will uh, support treatments, uh, planning and, and whatnot. Um, we have hundreds of other warehouse layers that we're gonna be uh, looking at. Um, these all supplement the data field collection in one form or another. Um, either we're going to try to pull data directly from the warehouse uh, to fill in fields or simply have those warehouse layers available both on the web and the iOS frame uh, to really support what's being done in the field to make sure folks are you know, in the right area. Um, they're able to see the their information, uh, their observations within the context of of information that has value to them. Um, right now, the wells is in there. It is one of the higher priority pieces, but there are certainly other other data elements within the warehouse that we want to bring in. We also want to bring in uh, other other data that's being collected outside of the warehouse. Um, a lot of organizations, a lot of the RISO groups have internal information that we should actually be able to bring in by by very similar mechanisms that uh, we've developed to address the warehouse pieces. Uh, we'll continue to work on quality control tools at all, all levels of the application, you know, basically making sure that we have complete and correct data uh, from the source uh, and that nothing is lost in the translation or migration into the database. There are lots of things left, on, left to do. Um, uh, we've certainly, uh, to this point, um, added a lot of the functionality uh, in the back end and the front end, but we recognize there's still much, much more to add uh, to make the applications fully functional to address all our business requirements. Um, and that's about it for me, uh, but certainly we can address some questions uh, down the road, but time is pressing. Zoe. Thanks, Mike. Guess what, you get to talk again about the Mapathon. Right. Okay. Well, it was just a, a, a brief uh, uh, piece. Um, one of the 
interesting things that happened in the lab um, was that we really, we hit a stumbling block and we were able to uh, facilitate um, or work with folks in the lab um, to really address a, a problem. Um, and as it turned out, our, our particular problem was common to a lot of other folks in government doing applications. And a mapathon was a, a very focused uh, two-day session where we brought in uh, developers and key resources throughout the, the government uh, arena um, to really address um, getting uh, the connectivity uh, to that warehouse and be able to pull things. It was called a mapathon, but it was really you know, dealt with spatial information, but also dealt with a lot of database and tables and stuff like that. So that was a skill set that um, uh, we acquired along the way, and it was pretty cool. And it, uh, uh, it has allowed us to uh, really move forward with, um, with a lot of things. So. Great. Thanks, Mike. Sorry. So other community contributions to our team. Um, we also had Gary Wong um, getting us started on using Cypress end-to-end -end testing. So the most challenging test for a team to write when moving to an automated UI test is often the first, and typically that will be logging in. So Gary provided invasives with a template that solved this problem. Um, he showed us how to get Cypress to log in via Keycloak Direct grant authentication. Uh, this will be useful for any team from the lab looking to move into using Cypress. Additionally, we also had Jason Leach um, setting up our mobile pipelines. So the process to get an app into the Apple Store involves a number of steps, none of which can be automated on OpenShift due to the need for Xcode. Jason built a pipeline on Microsoft's Azure, uh, takes the code from GitHub to test flight and ultimately the store. And devs, correct me if I'm saying any of this wrong. Um, and then lastly, Mike Wells also helping us get onto GitHub Actions. I know he spent um, a bunch of time with Pushin. Um, so Mike and I are on another project called MyRange BC. And since MyRange's development on OpenShift has started, it's been noted that Jenkins represents technical debt as it's something that we've been told we need to move off of as well as a source of operational issues. So GitHub Actions represents the new industry standard for continuous integration and deployment for open source projects hosted on GitHub, um, of which all the range projects are, are on and now Invasive BC is. And then lastly, community contributions from our team. So the creation of a form framework um, our team contributed to the theory for the form framework and how it can improve development. It's not a tool that's in a ready state for non-developers to generate a form. Um, it's for developers building an Express API and Angular front end to generate the database API and front end components of the form. Um, and then additionally, uh, the generation of a test data button. So the test data button that Andrea included in her demo for the Invasive BC web app is used by developers when we need to quickly fill out a form using valid test data so that we can progress to later stages in the workflow. So for example, testing out the submission process, reviewing a form, et cetera. It saves the developers a lot of time by not having to manually populate every field in a form. So in this sense, our community contribution for this is really just the idea as it's also not something that's in a ready state without modifications as the data is generated against the fields in the form framework. Does anybody have any questions regarding our community contributions? I think there's a, a lot of small contributions that were made to our team outside of those, those four. Those were just the four big ones that we, we could uh, think of when we, when we did the idea generation set session for this. Um, there's lots of small interactions with a ton of people in the lab who effectively contributed to the products that you saw today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jake. All right, so lastly, we're gonna finish off today with some lessons learned and favorite moments. So Mike, you'll be victim first. Uh, if you'd like to go through your lessons learned and favorite moments. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, certainly the biggest lesson uh, takeaway for me was that introducing something that is seemingly easy to envision um, 
simply because it's something that you've seen somewhere else and you think it's easy, ends up being a lot more complex. So much so, far more complex, sorry, than I've ever expected. So one of the things that I think I, I learned was, you know, really looking under the hood, making sure that, you know, all the technologies to um, make something happen um, can be uh, defined and scoped out such that we can arrive at that easy solution, um, um, overcoming all the complexities. Uh, my favorite moment, um, we had uh, early on in the project, we had a number of breakout session days. We called them design challenges where the, the team collectively focused on resolving um, a larger obstacle. Uh, we had three design sessions uh, that were really good. We had a, an initial data model design session. We had one around the inspect application, and then we had one around um, defining observations within the system. Those were my favorite times because that was that's where we really were uh, collaborative, creative, and um, you know working as a team to address a very specific obstacle that was uh, preventing us from moving forward. Thank you. Great, thanks Mike. Jake, would you like to go next? I can do that. Uh, so for my lesson learned on this project, uh, the big thing that I took away from this is learning um, how to do vertical slicing properly. Um, and it's something that I've taken forward into my work with the wildfires team. When we started building the invasive species application, I, I have the feeling that we went too deep too fast rather than figuring out how each of the, the observation, the treatment, and the monitoring records all worked with each other. Um, and, and understanding that at a very basic level with, without all of, the, all of the variables that were present. Um, as a scrum master, I think that's my biggest regret on the team is that I didn't push back there um, to, to keep the team moving forward through that workflow. So that's a, a big lesson learned for me and a takeaway from, from this team and, and it's impacting my work with wildfires today in that we're, we faced a similar scenario on the application we're building now and where we could have gone much deeper um, pulling in lots of different weather data sets in to uh, display and instead we, we've chosen to only move forward with two for now until we we see the end-to-end -end workflow of that application and then we'll build out the rest of the data sets for it so big lesson learned for me um, also the, this was my first uh, experience as a purely on a purely technical team as a scrum master so there's a ton of lessons learned that came with that uh, my favorite moment with the team there's there's definitely lots of things that pop in my mind I think uh, a couple key things stand out to me is stand-up meetings. Um, our stand-ups, though we didn't just uh, do our, what are we doing today? What are we doing? Or what did we do yesterday? Um, any impediments thing? We, we did do that, but we also had a lot more fun with it. Um, some fun questions was an early thing that we did. And then it moved into just banter about um, each other, the week, learning things and to the point where when we all became uh, disconnected a little bit because of COVID and in fact, some of our team members um, being stuck in, in India, we started to hold a 15 minute banter session right after stand up to start our day. So we do our stand up stuff and then we'd have another 15 minutes where no one had anything booked. So we would just chat and, and talk about whatever was on our mind or, or something funny we saw on the internet didn't matter. And I think those were my favorite times. Great. Thanks, Jake. Uh, I can go next. Um, mine's going to be pretty short and concise. Um, so my lessons learned um, is definitely just coming from a district range program and really having no experience in software development. Um, just really trying to learn and understand the language and to just never feel silly about asking people to break things down for me into layman's terms or providing that clarification. Uh, my favorite moments, uh, it's always the people component for me. I'd say my favorite moments always come from our team retros. When we get through all of the reflection and move on to playing a team game, it's been super fun navigating the world of virtual games. Uh, for example, our last retro, we had virtual charades and it was super fun to see everybody trying to provide clues for their cards. It was very interactive. 
yeah, that's my favorite moment. Who yeah. next on the team would like I to can, go? I can go next, yeah. This project, thank you, Lab and Invisive team, to you know give us opportunity to work with you guys. Uh, we really enjoyed and learn a lot. For me, it's not only learning about the technology or process, also you know community and culture because this is my first full scale project in Canada after means reaching Canada. So yeah, and the great main lesson learned from this project, yeah, so when I building the form framework. Initially, we tried to make it in you know, a very generic, reusable for many teams. Maybe that approach, you know, over complex few of our things. So we can keep simple and you can speed up. But yeah, and that is again, yeah, that is my lesson learned over here. And my favorite moments, lots of favorite moments with the team. The small our chatting and, you know, the gossip and everything. Yeah, we really enjoy everything. But my personal favorite moment when I come finish, you know, building up the whole pipeline, a standard pipeline, this is because that was my first and before our production push, yeah, I was very relieved at that time. So yeah, that's my personal favorite moment within, with the team, yeah. Thanks, Bhushan. Yeah. I can go next. Um, yeah, uh, I share a similar lesson uh, that uh, Pushan learned, which was our core framework, which is basically uh, a, so, some sort of an automation for our forms. Um, I think it saved us a lot of time in the front end uh, when uh, changes happen in an agile environment, having to change types of fields, move them, made, made those uh, changes really easy to handle. Um, but on the other hand, yes, I agree that the framework uh, add some complexity um, for the people who have to um, take it over. Um, and my favorite moment, it's definitely when uh, we we deployed the, the Inspect app and it's being used and seeing that it um, provides value. Great, thanks Amir. Yes, I'm up. Uh, so big uh, lesson learned for me was kind of the internal marketing of the stuff that we're creating. Uh, stakeholders are always busy and the people who are gonna be using our apps are always busy as well. So I think the big learning for me was making sure that everything we put out kind of is exciting always. Um, sometimes it's not as exciting because it's a backend change or whatever it might be, but always trying to think about how we wanna market the next little bit of functionality to them because if when they're not engaged, it means things like sprint reviews and things like that can just be uh, not so fun for everyone involved, right? So uh, that was kind of the big learning is trying to make sure that we engage them in a way that they're gonna be excited to come to sprint reviews and to review the things that we're talking about. So that's the big learning on that front. Um, but I think the biggest, uh, the most fun that I had on the project was the inspect application, having it happen so quickly from development right through to being used. Um, I think that was a really fun experience. And that was probably um, coming back to what Jake said. Um, that's probably the, we did a really good job of slicing it in a way that we were able to get it out the door fast. So that was probably the most fun we had because it was just kind of like rapid fire, let's go, let's go. So yeah, that's mine. Thanks Roop. I believe I'm the last one, last and least. Um, I would say lessons learned for me, there were a lot of them because this is my first job after graduating university. Uh, it's my first time working in a fully agile environment. Um, so for me, there were a lot of new technologies that I got to learn. Um, I got to learn a lot more about Agile and Scrum. Um, and so that has been really eye opening for me. Um, you know, and starting like, I would say, you know, from day two or whatever it was of my job where um, I was in the Agile Fundamentals course, um, right through to today, like, uh, there's always been such a heavy emphasis on being agile and being flexible. Um, and so that has been really interesting for me um, and a very valuable lesson in uh, 
um, in software development and just how government can shake up the status quo. Um, and yeah, there has not been as much playing with Lego as I was led to believe from Agile Fundamentals, but it's been good anyway. Um, and my favorite moment is probably uh, around Christmas time when we uh, had a little after work drinks. Um, that memory definitely stands out for me, just getting to spend some time with the team, getting to know each other outside of the office. I think also let's just note that it wasn't like, whoa, it was a crazy drunken evening or anything. It was just fun getting <laughs> together, just for the record. That <laughs> was your yeah, recollection. That's what I remember, at least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we all managed to get ourselves home. So, yeah, it wasn't that wild. Great. Thanks, Andrea. All right. And that concludes our graduation.